I thank the gentleman for yielding. Uh, I would like to follow up so, somewhat along the line that the ranking member was on. Uh, Mr. Patino bought 730 weapons, is our best count right now. He worked through Mr. Acosta. For both of my, uh, Special Agent Newell and uh, McMahon, was there a time in which either one of you were aware that Mr. Acosta buying weapons, the total of 730 from this particular straw buyer who was on food stamps, who had no income, was there a time that you became aware Mr. Acosta intended on transporting those weapons to the drug cartels to sell them? You have charged 19 straw purchasers who are all out on their own recognizance right now, just waiting for trial sometime next year. You have charged one person with trafficking. Was there a time you became aware that, in fact, you had a known, no, a known group of buyers, including Mr. Patino, at 730 weapons, and you knew that the purchaser, the money man, intended on transporting those to Mexico? Was there ever a time that you knew that? Mr. McMahon, first. Uh, there was never a time that I knew that, no. Mr. Newell. There was never a specific time that we knew that, no. I, uh, please stay away from words like specific. Oh. They worry me. Was there ever a time? Did you get to an understanding that you had a known buyer buying from these people with an intent to traffic them to the cartels? Was there a time? Throughout the investigation, we had information that what was the first time that you had that information? That this group was trafficking firearms to Mexico? That you had a known buyer, Mr. Acosta or that group, and that the purchasers, the, some of the straw purchasers they were buying from were, in fact, providing to these people for, the pur for their purpose of transporting? And I ask you this question very right. simply. No, so you have been, no, wait a second. You have been here right. as a paid not answerer so far. And I appreciate that you have been here as a paid not answerer, but there comes a point where I go, wait a second, 730 weapons bought by a man who had no money. Every penny he bought with he had to get from somebody. You knew that at some point. You knew who was buying them, and you allowed it to continue. Now, there comes a point where, as we go through the rest of the investigation, and this was about Mexico, and I want to get back to that very quickly. But there comes a point where we have to have more than just mistakes were made. My understanding is you knew from credible information, your organization knew that, in fact, you had a buyer providing the money to Patino and others, that he was taking possession of those weapons, and you knew with specificity that those weapons, some of them had already ended up in Mexico. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And what was the first date? 2009, what was the first date? Sir, to answer your question, throughout the investigation, we had information that Patino was, Mr. Patino was working with Mr. Acosta. Throughout the investigation, okay. I don't, I don't so from day one, day. you had a straw purchaser with no credit, no means of support, buying hundreds of weapons, providing them to his intermediary, which meant that both of them were very much part. You didn't have a, a buy and lie situation at this point. You had an individual who could be charged with his, his participation in the actual trafficking of weapons. You had somebody who was trafficking for the, specifically for the intent of getting it to the drug cartels, providing huge amounts of information, I mean, sorry, huge amounts of money. You had that early on. We are now two years later, and you have only charged 18 other people with buy and lie, and the one person you knew early on was doing this, where, quite frankly, is any semblance of roll-up or any semblance of going further, it looks like you knowingly allowed these to be sold, waiting to see if the other end in Mexico would give you information. It seems like you knowingly allowed these weapons to get out of your control, knowingly, to someone you knew was trafficking into Mexico, you saw the results, you allowed it to continue, and now you are telling us we don't let guns walk. Well, I have got to tell you, before this investigation ends, I have got to have somebody in your position or a justice admit you knowingly let guns walk, because right now your agents, both the agents here today from, from uh, Mexico 
and the agents that were part of Phoenix and part of this program who became whistleblowers have told us you were letting guns walk. It is only you and Mr. McMahon and other people at Justice who continue to come before this committee and say we don't let guns walk. Are they lying or are you lying? Sir, in this investigation, it is my opinion that we did not let guns walk. You are entitled to your opinion, not to your facts. With that, we go to the gentleman, Mr. Tierney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Wall, before you were uh, transferred to the ATF field office in Tijuana, Mexico, you were in the Phoenix office, is that correct? Yes, sir, I was. And you said in your written testimony that you personally saw some of the AFT's best trafficking cases languish in the U.S. Attorney's office. Is that an accurate statement? Yes, that is accurate, sir. Now, we have also had other ATF agents tell us the same thing, that there was a, a lagging of proceeding on these cases in the U.S. Attorney's Office. When was, it, when was that period of time that you were assigned to the Phoenix Office? Uh, well, I, I was working uh, primarily gun trafficking to Mexico from uh, 2007 to until I left for uh, Tijuana in 2009, fall of 2009. Thank you. Mr. Newell, a number of uh, ATF witnesses that the committee interviewed have said that this case was ready for indictment probably in August of 2010, but the U.S. Attorney's Office didn't really seek the indictments until January of 2011. Is that a, an accurate reflection of your yes. memory? Yes, sir. Okay. Do you know why you experienced these delays? I think that is a question better asked for the U.S. Attorney's Office, sir. Did they ever give you an understanding of why it was that they were seeking the delay? That they were continuing to put together the information they needed to seek indictments. And would that broad an explanation, those specifics? Certain specifics regarding financial, uh, financial uh, for uh, for the money laundering statutes that are in the funny money laundering violations that are in the uh, indictment. Okay. They, did they, you consider those reasons to be legitimate, or did you think that they were somewhat suspect? I, I believe that they were legitimate in the sense of uh, the return on some subpoenas. Yes, sir. Now, Mr. McMahon, you said that a number of your agents were certainly frustrated from time to time with the U.S. Attorney's Office in Phoenix, correct? Well, that is what was being relayed to me from Bill, yes. All right, but you didn't have a direct knowledge of that? The agent said not express it to you? No, I shouldn't say that. Yes, there is a, a personal friend that I had that works in Phoenix that uh, I hired in New York. Uh, he, he did express his frustration with the U.S. Attorney's Office, yes. Okay. Now, at some point in time when Mr. Newell and Mr. McMahon, you thought that the case was ready for indictment, that would be August 2010 and after that, uh, did you start using seizure warrants to, uh, to interdict some of the weapons? Yes, sir. We started doing that, I believe, in uh, September of 10, in an effort to um, seize firearms as we were waiting for the indictment. All right. So civilly, seize firearms civilly. So once you thought that the case had been made, yes, sir. Uh, then you started to try and take extra actions to make sure that the weapons uh, didn't get beyond a certain point. All right. And when would you exercise the seizure warrants in relation to this whole trafficking activity that was going on? Well, sir, I thank you for the question. During the summer of 10, um, we, um, we finally convinced certain individuals in the, in the judiciary to, to that we had a very strong, um, uh, we believed we had a very strong ability uh, or a, a theory on being able to seize firearms civilly in order to stem the flow. And that really got, we got that approved, I would say, September of 10. Now, this problem with the U.S. Attorney's Office in Phoenix, the lag of time between when the people in the field thought that they had their case made and, and waiting for the indictments to go down, is that a problem that uh, exists with the current U.S. Attorney? I will say, sir, that uh, having been there five years when I was there from 2006 to 2011, the current U.S. Attorney has been much more aggressive and much more proactive than, than previous administrations, yes, sir. Okay. The previous administrations, however, uh, were consistent in, uh, in having that issue? Yes, sir. Flag on that? Mr. McMahon, you told the committee that ATF agents had secured confessions from straw purchasers to develop certain cases, but that your agents presented those cases to the U.S. Attorney's Office in Phoenix, and the Assistant U.S. Attorney declined to prosecute and said there was no violation. Do you remember telling uh, the interviewers that? I, I do remember uh, speaking about a single case that was rela relayed to me by Bill Noll, yes. Okay. Could you give us the specifics of what it was you related? What was, was told to me was uh, we were working um, uh, an operation at, at a gun show. Um, our agents uh, observed someone that looked suspicious pushing a baby carriage with a couple of um, uh, long guns in it. Uh, they followed her out to the parking lot. 
um, where she actually transferred that to an individual and our agents saw a transfer of money. Um, we had other agents follow the car that had the guns now out of the parking lot, um, pulled him over, did a traffic stop, identified him as a multiple convicted felon with not only the two guns this woman gave her, but also a third gun. Uh, we also um, confronted the woman uh, and she confessed that uh, she was paid to, uh, to purchase these weapons. Uh, I believe it was a Saturday or Sunday when this happened. Uh, Bill relayed to me that uh, that was, that was uh, presented to the duty agent in, uh, in Phoenix, and uh, uh, they suggested that we take the case to state court. Okay, thank you. I am going to yield back to uh, the ranking member at this point in time. Thank you very much. We will ask that you also have another 30 seconds. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Special Agent Newell, um, I, I want to go back to something that the Chairman asked you, because I, I want to make, I want us to be real clear, and this is for the benefit the, of the entire committee. I have got to, I am trying to figure out what your definition of walking guns is. Maybe that is part of the problem. I think we, because I think almost everybody up here has our opinion about this, and I am just wondering if there is a difference between your definition of walking, allowing guns to walk, and ours. Well, thank you. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to answer that. My definition of walking, and I believe it is a common um, a common law enforcement term is when a law enforcement agency, be it ATF, be it DEA, be it a state and local agency, actually puts some sort of evidence into the hands of a suspect in furtherance of an undercover operation, furtherance of an investigation, and then does nothing to, um, it, it, with, the, with that property, that property, that either the, for instance, with ATF, it could be a prop gun, one of our evidence guns. You put it in the hands of that suspect and then don't take, um, don't, don't do the follow-up, don't attempt to determine where that front gun is going. So you don't, you don't think there was any walking allowed in this, based on that definition in this case? Based on that definition, yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Uh, we now go to the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Gosar, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Mr. Newell, I, you know, one of my colleagues on the other side brought it up about uh, new laws. Now, I want to emphasize it wasn't the gun sales operator. And let me emphasize that again. It wasn't, was it? Because they were alarmingly bringing forth these sales, were they not? Okay, I'm sorry, Congressman. Uh, here we go again. No, well, I, I didn't understand. It, it seems like this is the Mo Curley and Larry show, and we're looking for Larry. I mean, it's, it's, distru it's, it's disruptive to actually see what I'm seeing here. As a business person coming from uh, Main Street America, to actually see what I am seeing here, you have got to be disgusted about this. And to go around and around the, kernel, the corner, it is it's, 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 it's ridiculous. Agent Canino, I, I watch your body language. I am a, a health care physician. Yes, sir. Okay? I watch body language like crazy. Tell me what you disagree with that man right there. On this specific case? Yes. Everything. Talking about records. How about records? Let's talk about records. Are there adequate records being kept? At the FFLs? Yep. Yes, sir. And how about how they relate between the sale of these guns and Mexico? Can we choreograph that? Yes, sir. I think, I think ATF does a great job in, in regulating the firearms industry. But in this case, in tracking, did they actually, were they able to track them? They had no idea where they were going. No, were sir. The, only re the reason, the re <laughs> got to put this in context. Everybody is saying, oh, this case was so big, it was complicated. Firearms trafficking cases are not complicated, Thank sir. You. Okay? They are not complicated. The reason this case was so big was because we didn't do anything. Right. Plain and simple. Everybody wants to make this bigger than it is. Like I said earlier, you don't have the. I spent 19 years, 15 as a street agent, four leading a street group. Okay, you don't have the luxury or the right, in my opinion, as an ATF agent, to say I like this law, I like that law. Okay, that's you guys set the law, we follow it. Now it's up to me as an ATF agent how best. To, 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 produ uh, to make up an investigative technique and best practices so I can make a case and present it to the U.S. Attorney. I have done my job. Now, it is up to the U.S. Attorney if he wants to prosecute it or not. I am going to bring him the best case I can. In this case, like I said earlier, we have the ATF trafficking guidelines and best practices, and we just threw it out the window. Nobody got stopped. 
It's in, like I said earlier, it's, how can you let somebody buy 730 guns, and at what point are you going to stop them? I mean, well, we didn't even just do I, that. We prohibited wait, I am, I've, I, I am embarrassed, sir. I have agents, guys who I consider American heroes, my friends, who I've, I never thought I would hear this, who they've told me since this broke, Carlos, I'm ashamed to carry an ATF badge. To me, I have cried over that, literally, and I'm not ashamed to say that. That this is, this is not a job to me. It's a profession. I don't have a hobby. This, I, my hobby is being an ATF agent. I love this job. I hit the lottery when I came on. And I'm proud of what I do, and I'm proud of the ATF agents in this country. We have heroes. We really do. But, and I've been watching your body language, too, and Mr. Burton's. Um, I'm sorry, sir, but that's all I can say. I, I, have, I have no other way to describe this. Well, I mean, I look at this, and I look at, you know, you know when we're doing medical procedures, we look at what's, what's our end game and what's all the processes in between. And there's collateral damage. And the problem is the collateral damage is our crimes. And there are going to be deaths like we just saw, and there are going to be many more. And they're on this side and they're on that side. And you know what that tells me? That tells me that when we were in this planning stage, we got a problem. It's not on the field. It's right there in the office, in the head office of coming, up with, uh, coming up with this. This was absurd to even have this idea and to hear this merry-go-round back and uh, bantering, back and around, where we can't get an answer after, uh, from Mr. Newell. I mean, the buck stops with somebody. Who is it? It's obviously to me it's not these two gentlemen right here. I want to find out who Larry is. That's where we're going to have to go with this. But this is absurd. And that the fact that we used people's lives and, their, their, um, and, our, and our, our friends from Mexico as pawns in this without even discussing that, how absurd. And I, it, it's ever, it, it's ever, ever irreprehensible to even conceive of what's transpired here. And I hope the buck stops, and I hope you take a, a, uh, accountability all the way through, because this, this can't go on again. This is, I mean, both sides of the aisle are, are furious, and the American people ought to be furious at you. If this is what you, we get uh, for higher ups in, in ATF or in the Department of Justice, shame on you. I yield back to my I thank the gentleman. We now go to the gentleman from Virginia uh, for his five minutes, Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, I'm sure all of uh, our panelists are so pleased to be here today. Um, I guess I have a slightly different take on the subject. Uh, I don't defend Fast and Furious, and I don't defend uh, the actions of the U.S. Attorney's Office at the time in Phoenix, and I certainly believe that it was a botched attempt that led to a tragedy, uh, perhaps many tragedies. And I think this committee and its chairman are right to raise those issues and, uh, and to uh, try to assign blame. But there is another part of the story I doubt very much the press will print in tomorrow's headlines, because it is so much easier to print who screamed the loudest at ATF and that you got beat up. But what the press won't print tomorrow, sadly, is the fact that Congress's hands are hardly clean on this subject. We have done everything to make sure that the F in ATF is nullified. We have made sure that you haven't got a permanent director for six years. We laud the private sector. What private company would think it is okay to lack a permanent CEO for six years? We have done everything in our power in Congress to try to defang the ATF to make sure that it is toothless. We have done everything we can to fight your budget and reduce it so that you don't have the resources to do the job. We are not criticizing you for not doing well. We had testimony before this committee by one of your colleagues, called by the committee majority, who said there are more New York police officers per square mile in New York than there are ATF agents in all of the State of Arizona. And yet somehow we are going to stop the hemorrhaging of arms trafficking going into Mexico with that kind of paltry set of resources. But that won't be in the headline tomorrow. Some of the loudest critics of ATF today are also on a bill misnamed the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Enforcement Act. What does that bill do? 
It allows firearms dealers to liquidate their inventories after having their arms dealer license revoked and would decriminalize gun sale record keeping violations, even if they contributed to cross border gun trafficking. How does that help ATF and its mission? Where is the accountability here in Congress on this subject? It is easy to beat up on you. It is easy to look for a scapegoat when the agenda really is to make sure that we make it harder, not easier, to enforce gun trafficking. We had testimony from one of your colleagues before this committee who said there is more regulation on over-the-counter Sudafed than there is in arms trafficking going into Mexico. And he testified and was interrupted in this testimony, because it wasn't welcome, that he believed we needed to toughen enforcement laws as a tool for ATF to be able to fulfill its mission along the border. So I have no doubt that we can all pile on and correctly criticizing ATF for a botched mission. But what isn't said, and sadly what the press isn't going to bother to write about, but they should, is the fact that Congress for six long years and maybe longer has done everything in its power to make sure, in fact, you can't do your job. And this set of hearings needs to explore that, too. With that, I yield back the balance of my time to the ranking member. Uh, there, there is no, uh, currently no Federal statute that criminalizes firearm trafficking. <clears throat> Instead, traffickers are often prosecuted under 18 U.S.C. Section 922, which prohibits engaging in uh, firearms business without a license. Uh, the need for a Federal firearms trafficking statute was also a common refrain of law enforcement agents interviewed by the committee, as Mr. Connolly said. They told us that a dedicated firearms trafficking statute uh, would, would give them the ability to address patterns of activity by traffickers who divert firearms from legal to illegal commerce. Mr. Lenman, uh, based on your decades in law enforcement, do you believe a Federal firearms trafficking statute would be helpful in disrupting uh, the flow of guns to Mexi Mexican drug, drug cartels? Yes, sir. I have uh, viewed your proposed legislation. I agree with it wholeheartedly. Uh, one of the things that uh, I think might be added to that is a little more emphasis on uh, international trafficking, maybe uh, if we can tighten it up a little bit as far as going to drug cartels. I, too, think that if you reach a certain amount of weapons, that could even be a life offense. Thank you very much. Thank the gentleman. We now go to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Farenthold, also a member who went to Mexico City. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to take a moment to address something I heard before I asked the questions from the other side. They were talking about how much more difficult it is and how much more regulated the purchase of Sudafed is. I don't see anywhere in the Constitution where we are guaranteed the right to bear Sudafed, but we are guaranteed the right to bear arms. So I, I think that is an appropriate uh, or an inappropriate distinction. Um, Mr. McMahon, when my friend, the, the former prosecutor, the gentleman from South Carolina, uh, asked you uh, what the goal of this was, you said that it was to bring down a drug kingpin in Mexico. Is that a fair assessment? Did I say that, sir? I, I'm sorry. I guess that was Mr. Newell. Did you say that, Mr. Newell? I, I believe what I said was the goal of the investigation was to disrupt and dismantle an entire uh, firearms trafficking network. Yes, sir. And so and I believe you said a drug kingpin. Let me ask uh, Mr. Gill, do, and, and to identify some drug kingpins, let me ask Mr. Gill, does the Mexican government know who the drug kingpins are in Mexico? Sir, uh, they are aware of the heads of the, of the organizations. Uh, as, and to answer your question shortly, yes. Um, and so let me go ahead and ask you another question there, Mr. Gill. Would, in your time working with the Mexican government as a former ATF attache in Mexico, did they ever ask us to uh, do anything like that? You know, you let guns come across the border so uh, they could track them or uh, find or bring down government king, uh, drug kingpins? No, sir. All right. Let me go on uh, to, uh, to Mr. 
Canino, I, I want to applaud your service and your candor with this committee. Uh, we have heard that you know, we are trying to bring down the drug kingpins or whatever the words were as far as uh, stop the trafficking. If you were put in charge of developing an investigation to do that, uh, how would you do that? Would your plan involve uh, letting firearms move across the border? Or how, how would you do it? To stop a drug kingpin? Or, or to stop the, or if you want to even go more uh, well, simply with the firearms, stop the firearms trafficking. Well, to stop a drug king, kingpin, I'd call DEA, because that's what they do, <laughs> number one. Number two, it's a, you work the traffic investigations paint by, paint by the numbers. The, it's frustrating to be an ATF agent. That's, that comes with the badge, okay? Um, these trafficking investigations, the laws, like I said, you have to be open-minded, I guess is the word I'm looking for. I don't know if that's the best description. But like I said, it's paint by the numbers. You have to work. It's like building a house. You start building a foundation, you work from the bottom up. In this case, nobody got stopped. They didn't grab somebody right, and, so, and say, okay, hey, we're going to roll you. I mean, there's, I don't, and I don't want to go into sources and methods, but there's a whole you know, we, we have schools yeah. on this. Yeah, if you watch a cop show, you know how it's done. Right. You, you, you follow the guns or you, or you arrest them at the first stop and try to flip them both. Or if you really want to work and partner with the Mexican government, you follow the guns till it crosses the border and radio across to your colleagues in Mexico and they move it up the line there. It seems like common sense to me. Let me ask, I, I want to ask this question to everybody on the panel because I think this is really important. We have seen Operation Fast and Furious. We have recently heard about Operation Castaway, a similar uh, program in Florida. Are there, are any of you all aware at this time of any similar operations going on that allow guns to flow across the border to friendly countries now? Are you all aware of those? And if you are, are we doing anything to stop them? And if you could just uh, come on down the line, we will start with Mr. McMahon. I am not aware of any case like that, a friendly or unfriendly government, no. Neither am I, sir. Any, is, is anybody? Uh, no. No, sir. I'm not aware no, of any. No, sir. And we only found out about this one through whistleblowers. And my prayer is that if there is anybody watching uh, this committee hearing, that's ATF or another agency, that knows of something going on like this, that they let this committee go about it. This is one of the most shameful moments, I think, in our government's history when we are letting uh, guns go across the border to our, our friends in Mexico. Let me just ask another. Uh, I only have 32 seconds left. I'm going to stick around for a second round of questioning, so I'll yield back my remaining 30 seconds. Uh, and I'll pick it up. Uh, Special Agent Newell, what did this program expend in money? Millions of dollars, right? The, the program or the, the well, it, network? Fast and Furious. We, we, up on this side, we think of it as a program. You think of it as a simple investigation. The investigation, you spent millions of dollars over the course of two years, correct? I don't believe it was millions of dollars, sir. Hundreds of thousands? Probably a couple hundred thousand dollars, yes, sir. Agents were camped out in some cases for a period of time at a drop location? Yes, sir. So when you were trying to do the big hit, the big fix, the big get the roll, big guys, why is it that testimony shows us that only three times were there any uh, kind of detection plants, and I don't want to get into sources and methods either, but only three times we've been told that they try to do any detection, and one of these GPS tracking was a, was a radio shack, make it yourself. Why in the world, with the quality and, this, and the quantity of agents and time, video cameras planted with Internet connections, et cetera, why is it there wasn't some tracking to track the weapons? We had trackers on, on vehicles, sir. We had tra and the, the trackers you mentioned on weapons. But again, it goes to resources. I mean, it's, it's a resource issue. We have agents that are out there working 16, 18, 20-hour days, and we— uh, Unfortunately, you just made my case, and time has expired. 18 hours of, a, of an agent's time is so much more money than one of these tracking devices that you were penny wise and pound foolish by not having sophisticated devices. With that, we go to the gentlelady from the District of Columbia for her five minutes. Ms. Norton. Well, suppose you had had a trafficking, trafficking device. Then what would have been the next step? Well, ma'am, it depends on uh, how long the firearms stayed in the area. For instance, many of, in many of the transactions here, the firearms uh, never left the Phoenix area. And trackers, the battery life of a tracker is only good, you know, depending on. So you know, if it didn't leave the, the, the Phoenix area, what could you charge uh, this so called trafficker 
this law-abiding citizen there, he doesn't have a record, but he's buying uh, many, many guns. What could you charge him with? Well, there's nothing to charge him with at that point. We have to prove a violation has existed, has occurred. You know, I, I just want to say, um, it, uh, to, 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 to sit in a hearing and hear people beat up on the ATF is very, very interesting to me. You sit in a Congress where the gun lobby controls the Congress of the United States. On the Republican side of the aisle, they totally control it. On my side of the aisle, they virtually control it. And the Second Amendment is cited as, as you try to do your job to keep guns from essentially bringing down the government of an ally. Now, when it comes to Mexico, let me ask you, what kind of gun control laws does Mexico have? Any of you know about their gun control laws? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am, I do. Yes, sir, would you speak up? Um, <clears throat> civilians could buy um, nothing greater than a 38 caliber. Anything after that is for the exclusive use of uh, the military and the police. So here is Mexico, who does its job on its side of the border. It says you uh, essentially, it, it makes it very difficult for anyone except someone in law enforcement or the military to get a gun. So they come to the United States, where trafficking is, is, is wide open. And let me ask you this. We are concentrating on Mexico now. Let me ask you about trafficking to Chicago. Let me ask you about traveling to the District of Columbia, to Baltimore. Let me ask you about trafficking to LA. Do these same traffickers operate as effectively in our country as we have now seen them operate, taking guns to Mexico? I believe, I believe that the, the organizations are a little bit different. That is why I said earlier about we have never encountered an organization like this in Mex for Mexico. The, the trafficking in the U.S., my experience anyway, is a little bit different. Uh, it is a little bit more uh, association related, but uh, obviously trafficking domestically is a major issue for us, and I spent the majority of my career working those kind of cases. If um, uh, a person, let us say, buys uh, 200 guns, and here you made mistakes, if I had a dollar for every mistake this Congress has made when it came to guns, I'd be a very rich woman. You made a mistake. It was a fatal, fatal mistake. It was a mistake for which you are being held accountable. Let's say you hadn't made a mistake, that someone without a record bought guns. That's me. You found me with 200 guns. What could you do to me? Uh, nothing at all, ma'am. Would uh, did you feel disarmed in your fight against this wholesale movement of guns from our country to Mexico, or did you feel you were equipped to, in fact, uh, by law enforcement to do what was necessary? Yeah, I, I think my experience, ATF agents are very resilient. You have to be to make the case, um, and that is what our people do, and they, they do that every day, and they are out there doing that today. And they may design tactics to try to make them to, to make themselves more effective on the ground. I think that's what we should always be doing. Yes. Um, would, could I ask each of you? Uh, would you feel better able to stop this traffic if the Congress passed a law uh, that made it? And, and, and added to our criminal code a, a section that prohibited the transfer of a gun when an individual knows the gun will be transferred to a person who is prohibited from carrying a gun or intends to actually use the gun illegally. We currently do have a statute that, that does handle that. That is the whole lying on the Federal form violation. So, but lying on the Federal form gets you to where? Gets us to, if we can know, prove that someone knowingly filled out that form incorrectly or lied. Can you seize guns? We have been talking about seizures here. In order to seize guns, what does the ATF have to show? 
that a violation of laws are committed with that firearm. Well, I'm back the, to the gentlelady's time has expired, but if anyone else wants to answer the question on what's no, yeah, I'm back to what, to what, what, what's the law that's been violated. If anyone else wants to answer, yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have to pr uh, prove beyond a reasonable doubt that that firearm was in some way used in violation of a, a, a furtherance of violation of a crime or in violation of a crime. We can't just go out and randomly seize firearms from individuals. Firearms are in themselves not contraband. If we stop someone on the street with five AKs, ten AKs, twenty AKs, or a hundred AKs, or 100, and they're not prohibited, as frustrating as that may be, and, and believe me, it's extremely frustrating. But as frustrating as that may be. We may not have any legal ability to take those to seize those firearms. Hey, anyone else want to answer on that, Mr. Gill? Yes, Mr. Chairman. In my experience, and as I look around the room here, I've had the opportunity to work in pretty much every, you know, pretty much every state of the of the union, and uh, I've always been able to use the current laws to to success in in the investigations. Whether you're pulling somebody over with a hundred AK-47s. I found that ATF uh, special agents are very qualified in interviewing techniques. 99.9 percent .9 of the time, we'll get confessions from those individuals. We'll take those guns, and if not that case, then we would at least end up getting a uh, an abandonment from them for those weapons, so they don't hit the streets. So there are other avenues to approach versus uh, uh, that we could use under the current laws. Thank you. We now go to the most qualified person on the committee to ask questions, the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Meehan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Special Agent Keene, you are a trained special agent for ATF. Are you trained in the issue of walking guns? No, sir. Is there any, res with regard to walking guns, when you are in training, what do you know about, what does ATF tell you about walking guns? You don't, you don't want guns. Sir, I teach at the ATF National Academy. I teach at our first, uh, first line supervisor school. I teach at our command and control school for uh, GS-15s and above. Are we you aware of anybody who has been disciplined for walking a gun at ATF? No, sir, but I can, Darren was talking to me last night and he put it in perspective. If you are an ATF agent and you lose your gun, it is three days, no questions asked, up to termination on the circumstances. So if you lose your gun? But it was your gun. It's three days. Gun. Right. What do you define as walking a gun? What exactly happened in this case? Tell you me, have in to, your words, what do you think walking a gun is? Walking a gun is when you have custody and control of that firearm and you let it get in the hands of a suspect and you don't interdict that suspect. In this case, um, we had cooperators at the gun stores, so they are acting as agents of the government. So it doesn't matter if those guns came out of an ATF uh, uh, prop fault or. Okay. Thank you. Agent Newell, is that what you meant when you said that if ATF puts evidence into the hand of the gun or into the hands of a suspect, there is a distinction somehow between a straw purchaser getting it or ATF putting it? Please explain to me what you talked, what you meant by the distinction of ATF putting it in the hands of a suspect? The distinction for me, Congressman, is that is ATF actually putting evidence or some sort of prop firearm in the hands of a suspect. So that is a distinction from a straw purchaser who goes and under your observation? In, in that aspect, yes, sir, it is. So, so, so you are suggesting here that the distinction is because you did not put the hand the gun in the hands of the purchaser here, that somehow there is a distinction from allowing a gun to walk? Well, I, Congressman, I, I disagree with something Mr. Canino just said regarding the, the fact that the FFLs were acting as agents of the government. Um, as in my recollection in this case, the uh, two FFLs in particular were clearly uh, instructed as to the follow the letter of the law. Um, to abide by the rules and regulations. Let's, 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 let's move on, because that is the distinction. The, the strategy, you were asked a specific question, who defined the strategy for Fast and Furious? Well, a, a case like Fast and Furious goes through several levels of approval. Sir. Who originated the strategy for Fast and Furious? I, I believe it was at, this, at the street level. Tell me who the person is who created the strategy for Fast and Furious. You are the special agent in charge of your area. It emanated from your district. Right. Who originated the concept for Fast and Furious? It, it, 
Sir, it's not one person who did that. It was a group of individuals who looked at the set of facts in this case and determined that this was the best strategy to follow to take off the whole thing. What do you mean? Where did it start? Where does the stream start? It tell, starts. Tell me who participated in that conclusion. Well, it was it's several individuals. It was the group supervisor, the assistant special agent in charge, myself, and individuals in, in headquarters. Okay. So there was a number of people who were very learned in this process. Now, you testified here today earlier, no part in the strategy to allow guns to be taken to Mexico. It was no part in the strategy to allow guns to be taken to Mexico. Is that right? To knowingly allow guns to, to go to Mexico, To yes. knowingly allow well, guns to sir, go to Mexico. Sir, in this case, we did everything. We had seizures in this case when we had evidence. I, I asked you a specific question. I said that there was no part in the strategy to allow guns to go to Mexico. Is that accurate? Yes, sir. Would Mr. McMahon have participated in any way in the development of this policy or, or, or this, the, the Fast and Furious um, uh, strategy? I know he was aware of it, yes, sir. He was aware of it. Mr. McMahon, you testified, a plaza boss. He has $70,000. He wants $70,000 worth of guns. What is a plaza boss? It is uh, someone in a hand, uh, uh, controls an area for a, a cartel. And, and where is that plaza boss? In, in Mexico. So, so you testified that part of the theory here, your words, is the plaza boss expects $70,000 worth of weapons. Correct. Mr. Newell, the strategy Mr. McMahon identifies that you expect, you understand that he expects $70,000 worth of weapons. Where does that get in that there was no part in the strategy to allow guns to be taken to Mexico? Yes, sir. We, had, we still during the beginning parts of this case, we did not know who the plaza boss was. We didn't know That's who not my question about who the plaza boss was. The question is, is there a plaza boss? Mr. Agent McMahon just said he's in Mexico. Right. And, and, and the plaza boss expects $70,000 worth of guns. Now, you are saying no part of the strategy was allowed to guns going to Mexico. Who is right here? S sir, the, the, the strategy wasn't to allow guns to go to Mexico. But, but, but what did Agent McMahon just say? Who, this was an OSADEF case. Yes. Who else participated in this in the form of this going up? I would ask unanimous consent the gentleman be allowed to have another 30 seconds. Thank you. Sure. Was this an OSADEF case? Yes, sir, it was. Okay. That implies that at a certain point in time it moves beyond your agency, does it not? Yes, sir. What does that mean with regard to OSADEF? What kind of other participants were there as part of OSADEF? Well, there's other agencies that were involved in this. Other agencies. Yes. What other agencies were involved in this? In, in this investigation, uh, they were full partners in this case, was uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, now known as Homeland Security Investigations. We had uh, Internal Revenue Service, and we had assistance uh, to some level from DEA. So are you saying DEA, IRS, and ICE all knew about this, this program? To they participate involved. in the OSADEF? They participated in the investigation, yes. Sir. In the investigation. Were they aware that guns were being walked to Mexico? Sir, again, I'm assuming that they were. I mean, I know they were aware of the strategy, but it's, it's they were aware of the strategy. Yes, sir. Which included what Special Agent McMahon talked about allowing seventy thousand dollars worth of guns to go to the Plaza Boss. Uh, sir, I, I've never said that we are allowing seventy thousand dollars worth of guns to go. On. I you was said it was a, the expectation. I was giving a scenario of how it, it works. There's a Plaza Boss in Mexico that's requiring seventy thousand worth of guns. So if he's not getting it from the network we're investigating, he's getting it from somewhere else. It wasn't the $70,000 example I gave you wasn't specific to this investigation. It was an overreal generalization of how trafficking to Mexico works. But we are talking about plaza bosses. We are talking about plaza bosses in Mexico. The gentleman's time has expired. We were going to have a, a second round just a moment. The gentlelady from New York, Ms. Burke. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I am uncertain as to where to start here because of what I have heard. I think that I will start with Mr. Canino. Mr. Canino, your comments were that it is inconceivable to let guns go. It is not the way the ATF does things. So in your experience, is what happened in op an Operation Fast and Furious an aberration from the usual way that ATF does business? This is the first time I have ever heard of anything like this. In 20, I'll be, I start my 22nd year on Friday. This is the first time I have heard anything like this. And during the course of this operation, were you advised that there was going to be, at what point did you become aware that there was going to be a different method of operation? And 
Ma'am, I need to put this in context. I didn't, the first time I ever heard of someone accusing ATF agents of actually watching suspected gun traffickers just drive away was when Special Agent Dotson was on CBS. I had, and I didn't believe him, and I was very vocal about that. I didn't become aware until it started coming out little by little, talking to fellow agents, uh, and then mid-April, I saw some uh, documents, and that convinced me that what Special Agent Dotson was alleging was, in fact, correct. Thank you. And the other special agents that are here, Mr. Gill, Mr. Wall, Mr. Ledman, in your experience, is this the first time you've ever seen ATF operate this way? Again, I recently retired, and after uh, going on 23-plus years, uh, it's inconceivable. And again, uh, I didn't believe it even after seeing Mr. Dodson as well. And I still didn't believe it until after I uh, talked with Mr. Dodson and others that then I became convinced that perhaps ATF did walk these weapons. Okay. And Mr. Wall? As I stated in my opening uh, remarks, uh, yes, it's the first time I have ever seen it. And I was very skeptical. I didn't believe Mr. Dodson at all. And Mr. Ledman? Ma'am, uh, part of my duties and functions is to look at the uh, southwest border cases, all of them. And this is the first one I have seen. But I would like to add something that the panel was asking earlier. Uh, you asked when we first became aware that Mr. Acosta right, was involved as the leader of the straw purchasing ring and uh, some of the other issues as to Mr. Patino. That was in 2009. And it was early on. I briefed it to uh, uh, my senior directors January of 2010. And we know this, and one of the driving forces behind how we know that these were going to Mexico, and there were Mexico people involved, is because our other law enforcement partners provided us with information, specific information, that allowed us to know exactly what was going on and to what cartel it was going to. This was not a mystery. We knew this in December of 2009. I briefed it in 2010, January. Thank you, sir. So Special Agent Newell and uh, Special Agent McMahon will we'll get to you because you are his supervisor. So at some point, based on the IG's report and DOJ, they said, we are going to try something different here. I am assuming, because that is the way things work in government, maybe I am wrong, that someone said, we need to have this operation and we are going to make a determination that for the first time ATF is going to conduct business this way. We are going to let these guns walk. Now, they maybe didn't say it, but in essence, that is really what happened. This is a different way of conducting business for the ATF. Where would that plan have come from? Somebody, I know you said you sat down with this group, Mr. Newell, but somebody higher up than you made a determination that for the first time, ATF was going to run this. We have heard from this panel, we have heard from the panel prior to today, that this is a complete aberration from the way the ATF has done business. Where would that have come from? Well, ma'am, in, in, in putting the strategy together for this case, we, the, the strategy came from several places. Department of Justice issued in, uh, in originally a draft in 2009, October 2009 and January 2010, about how to combat southwest border uh, drug trafficking by Mexican drug cartels, and one of them dealt with firearms trafficking, which said, uh, by, through use of the OSADEF co-located strike forces, a mere interdiction is not the answer. You have to go after the structure, the organization of the, of the uh, uh, whatever it be, firearms, human, drug trafficking organizations to make the biggest impact. Okay. And, and who would that memo have come from? I, I do believe that memo came uh, down from uh, the Deputy Attorney General's office. Okay. And then, so this is now we are going to change strategy. This is going to be a different way to uh, conduct an operation. So you get your directive from then, and then these groups that you talked about, you, you sat down, you came up with a plan, or did that plan come from up on high? The plan figured into, into uh, or the memo figured into how we were going to address this what, when we first looked at it in November 2009, was already a very active, prolific firearms trafficking organization. As Mr. McMahon testified, in my 23 years, we have never seen an organization that was this uh, prolific in buying firearms in such a short period of time. 
So we felt that at that time, in conjunction with the OSADEF Strike Force, where this group, Group 7, was located, that the best way to attack this organization was through the use of, you know, a multi-agency, uh, conspiratorial-type investigation would dismantle the whole organization. The gentlelady's time has expired. We now go to the gentleman from Mich Michigan, Mr. Amash. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm going to yield my time to Mr. Gowdy. I thank the gentleman from, uh, from Michigan. Mr. Ledman, for those who are uh, perhaps watching and not familiar with the full panoply of investigative techniques, surveillance uh, is a tried and true investigative technique, correct? Yes, sir. What about consensual encounters where you just do a knock and talk, where you walk up to someone and ask them? I mean, there is a reason Dostoevsky wrote Crime and Punishment. There is a reason Edgar Allan Poe wrote The Telltale Heart. Sometimes people confess, don't they? Yes, sir. There are there's several tools in the toolbox, especially when you are faced with uh, the fact that we know that these weapons were going to be used in such carnage down in Mexico and the United States. We should have pulled every tool out of that toolbox not just to make our case. Our case should not have been the priority here. The stopping, the, the flow of those firearms should have been the number one priority, and we should have reached into that toolbox. We should have conducted interviews, or we should have done interviews uh, to uh, or surrounding people. We should have uh, tracked these weapons better. We should have followed everything by the letter to stop them. I mean, just where do we stop with the number of guns? One? Have you, Five, ever, ten? have you ever heard tell of a law enforcement officer stopping someone for speeding when really they may have had another purpose in mind? I have heard uh, that it happens from time to time. People on your way for them, you know, it's con they're going crossing to the yellow line. Right. Sooner or later, you're going to make a mistake, and then exactly. And when you do a lawful, non-pretextual car stop, it also opens up the full panoply of other search options, right, like searching the vehicle or a pat-down? Yes, How should. about a proffer? Is, is that, is that, a, is that in, your, in your toolbox to go to yes, a sir. United States attorney and say, I would like to proffer this person, I would like to send him a grand jury subpoena? Correct. It is the same way you conduct every other investigation other than this one, right? Correct. From shoplifting to murder, we do them all the same way except this one. Correct. Special Agent no, I happen to think this was ill-conceived from its inception. You have testified repeatedly that the purpose was to destroy, dismantle um, drug cartels. So I I'm going to ask you again, how would this ever have succeeded? What was your purpose? How would we have known, hey, this was a great investigation, it succeeded? Sir, you, you, you said that to disrupt a drug cartel. It, the, the, the purpose of this investigation was to disrupt and dismantle a firearms trafficking organization that was feeding firearms in Mexico, in the United States. The firearms trafficking organization in the United States, not only the straw purchasers, the middlemen, the transporters, the financiers. That was well. Then, when the guns were going into Mexico, you should have known that this was an abject failure because that's not what you wanted, right? Absolutely. We didn't want any guns. So when you found out the first gun went to Mexico, why didn't you not abort the investigation? Because we were still putting the facts together to be able to convict when all the When is individuals. the very first time you knew or should have known that firearms were going to Mexico? Well, I believe it was when, I got the first, we, when we got the first traces. I was advised of the first traces, which I believe was November of 2009. 2009. And when did you abort the investigation? The investigation is ongoing, sir. Right. That is my point. So you knew the weapons were going to Mexico. Right. Were you at some point going to let Special Agent Canino know about it? Mr. Canino knew about the investigation. He knew, he knew that, you, that, that weapons were going into Mexico? Well, absolutely, yes. When were you going to let your Mexican counterparts know about it? I'm assuming they knew that firearms, because I have, you know, sir, one of the issues about that is there is only one field division in this country, only one that has a PGR representative in it, uh, that is the Mexican Department of Justice. In all my years of working with Mexico, I spent four years in Bogota, Colombia, representing ATF in South America. I am very, very, very key on the fact that we need to share information with our foreign law enforcement partners. Well, you testified earlier that you were going to turn the information over to Mexican prosecutors and let them prosecute, because I asked you, were you also going to allow U.S law enforcement officers to be extradited to Mexico for breaking their law, and you said no. So my question to you is this. How in the world are you going to get 
our brothers and sisters in law enforcement to trust. That. Why would you trust the prosecution if you don't trust them during the investigation? Well, sir, to answer your question about the drug cartel, the kingpin, or if you, your words, the kingpin to get the, that we are going to get the guns in Mexico, we did not have information until late in this case, an ongoing part of this case, who that individual was. And I invited, with Mr. Canino, we invited in December of 10, as well as in January, Mexican prosecutors to come in. I don't think that's ever been done before, and I'm the one that requested it. Uh, did, did you debrief them on Fast and Furious? Yes. Did, did you tell them that guns were going into Mexico? Well, yes. You told them when? In, well, my PGR representative that I have in my office, who has been there for two years, knew about this case, not in specific. When the first gun showed up in Mexico, he was that aware. you knew was from Phoenix, the first one that was connected to this showed up in Mexico, did you go interview the straw purchaser? No, sir, we did not. Why not? Because, again, our strategy was, and we knowing from years of experience, you take off one straw purchaser, you are not having an effect on the greater organization, which is at that point in November of 2009, you have to realize it wasn't even Have you ever secure. flipped a cooperating witness before? Yes, I have. How do you do it without asking them? How do you do it without interviewing them? It depends on what your goal is in the investigation. Your goal is to bring down an organization. It is very compelling testimony to have someone from within the organization testify against his comrades, right? Yes, sir. So why didn't you go, why didn't you approach him? Approach who, sir? The, the, the one straw purchaser? The, yes, the straw sure. purchaser. Again, the goal, sir, in this case was to uh, take off the whole organization. We felt that by, by, working, by just trying to flip one straw purchaser, if he in fact did flip, it would not affect the overall goal. Of so these the gentleman's time has expired. Uh, we will have a second round. We now go to the gentleman from Idaho, Mr. Labrador. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Special Agent Canino, I just think I just heard Special Agent Newell say that you knew about uh, this gun walking. Okay, can you please? Uh... Yes, sir. I want to make it perfectly clear to you, the American people, the Mexican government, my family, my friends, at no time ever did I know that ATF agents were following known suspected gun traffickers, one of which bought 700 guns, and we knew about his guns showing up in Mexico six weeks after we opened up that investigation. Never, ever did I, would I imagine that we were letting that happen. We have 4,000 investigations, plus or minus, with uh, Mexico-U.S. Uh, nexus. There are guns coming in. That is trafficking. The guns are coming into Mexico. I have no clue that we were allowing these guys to operate like this. Like Mr. Gowdy said, we didn't even bother. There was no interdiction. To start any case, you have to, you have a toolbox. We have classes. Jose Wall teaches those trafficking classes. I have been to them. It is like building a house. You start from the bottom and you try to work your way up. You know, at one point, you are only going to go reach so far. And then you come in and you have a meeting and you say, okay, how can we advance this? You meet with the U.S. Attorney. From what I see here, none of this was done. Or if it was, it wasn't very effective. So when, when did you first realize that the gun walking allegations were true? April. Of this year? I, when, yes, April. I mean, I was starting to lean that way, and then I was at ATF Bureau headquarters in April for a meeting, and I sat down with Mr. Ledman, and uh, he convinced me. Okay. Did you come across any specific evidence to prove that ATF had taken part in these actions? One more time, sorry. Did you come across any specific evidence to prove that ATF had taken part in these actions? Well, from, his, from the totality of the circumstances and then, you know, speaking with different agents and speaking with Mr. Ledman, um, yeah, and, you know, the guns showing up in Mexico. Um, Did you review any documents or anything? I, you know, sir, I, when I visited Mr. Ledman, um, I saw, uh, I took a look at the management log, and um, if I read it correctly, uh, there were three instances in the first two pages where, um, we walk away from guns. At that point, I was so disgusted, I didn't even want to look at the case file anymore. And when was that? That was in mid-April. 
or so well, of this year. What, why were you so upset with this information? Because it goes against everything we're taught. I mean, you, like I was explaining earlier, you, you don't do that. We're not taught to do that. From the first day we walk into the academy all the way till you leave this job, like, like Darren said. That's, it's not a recognized investigative technique. This, like I, this is not a special case. This is just a trafficking case that we do. This is what we do, you know, we, amongst other things. But trafficking is, is what we do, especially on the southwest border. This, was, this wasn't a one of. This wasn't a who done it. This was, you know, this just, was a ground ball. Just a basic game, basic, basic case. <laughs> yeah. What you do every day. Hmm. Exactly. M Special Agent Newell, uh, do you know who Kevin O'Reilly is? Yes, sir. What's the nature of your relationship with him? I have known Kevin for, I would say, probably 10, 12 years. Uh, how often do you communicate with him? Oh, I haven't communicated with him in a while, but probably three or four times a year or something like that, or maybe, maybe more, depending on him reaching out to me. Isn't it a little bit unusual for a special agent in charge of an ATF field division to have direct email contact with the national security staff at the White House? He is a friend of mine. How many times did you talk to him about this case? The specifics of this case? Uh, I, don't think I, I, mean, the gen I don't think I had one specific conversation with him about the specifics of this case. Okay. Uh, who but would the gentleman allow me to help him a little? Uh, you don't, not that you need it, but could you take the word specific out and, and answer the general? Did you talk to him about this case? I might have talked to him about this case, yes, sir. Uh, do you know when that was? I was probably, I, as I recall, I think it was during the summer, might have been the summer or early fall of 2010. Okay. So, Special Agent McMahon, you took responsibility this morning here for the actions of the agency, and I appreciate that. Uh, who at the highest levels, uh, I can't imagine that this is something that you decided to do on your own. Uh, who did you communicate with at the highest levels about this? This case, I communicated to my chain of command within ATF. Um, we're all very much aware of this investigation and what was going on. And who was aware at who was aware that this investigation was occurring and that guns were being walked uh, to Mexico? You can you can answer that question. Time has expired, but go ahead. I mean, there, no one was aware that guns were walking uh, at my level or above me. Um, and again, I think we are getting caught up in this whole definition of walking, but even given whatever the definitions are, no one from my level up knew of any gun walking. I thank the gentleman. We now go to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Ross, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. McMahon, I uh, had an opportunity to read your opening statement. I apologize I have been out of here. And I, first of all, appreciate your service, and I understand your remorse with what is going on here. Uh, but I got to uh, talk to you a little bit about your interview that you had, your transcribed interview, and I would like to um, review some of that with you. In fact, uh, if, uh, if I could get slide six brought up. Um, this is a transcript of your interview that you had and, um, before the committee when you were asked whether you read the wiretap um, applications uh, for, for the Fast and Furious, and you responded, no, I did not. Uh, do you recall that question and that, and that answer? I do. Okay. And then when you, a you were asked if it was your job to sign off on the wiretap applications, uh, you stated, no, I never signed off on a memo for a wiretap application. Is that That's correct. That, and that was your statement then? It's still today? Yes, it is. Okay. Um, slide 7. Could we see slide 7? Okay. Uh, this is a memorandum uh, dated February 5, 2005, that uh, addressed to you from the Group Supervisor of Phoenix Group 7, and the first line states, this memorandum serves to request authorization to initiate a Title III cellular telephone intercept. Um, it is addressed to you. Do you recall that memorandum? I recall seeing it just recently, yes. Just recently? So That's correct. You don't recall seeing it before? I do not. At all? I do not. Okay. Um, slide 8. Can we get slide 8 up there? And this is um, 
an email from William Newell to you on February 5, 2010. And attached to this email was um, uh, an email, it was an, a memo that, was, that we just saw in the past uh, slide. And the email states that attaches the cover-up memo requesting authorization to conduct a T3 intercept on the main suspect OCDETF strike force firearms trafficking case out of the Phoenix entitled The Fast and Furious. I am FedExing that to you. Do you recall receiving that email? I don't recall, but I mean, I obviously received that email, yes. Okay. I don't specifically recall receiving this email, no. Do you recall seeing the attachment that was attached to it? No, I do not. And I, I, think, uh, if, I think our email records show that they weren't able to scan the attachment to, because it was so large and they said they were going to FedEx it. And who said that to you? I think it says it here in this email. Th it told you that it was too large? That's, that's what I read okay. here. It says, uh, I could not scan the actual affidavit to, due to its size, so I am FedExing it. So scanning it would mean to attach it to this email. Now, this is a, this is a request for, for a wiretap. This right. is or, um, uh, yeah. This this, this with, it has a re request for a wiretap that's attached to the well, email. A wiretap is actually an affidavit that's prepared at the, the U.S. Attorney's Office. Okay. So let's go to slide nine then. Okay. This is uh, an affidavit prepared by Special Agent Hope McAllister in support of an application for authorization to intercept wire communications. is attached for your review. Um, now the signature block is for Mark R. Chait. But there is uh, someone else's signature there. Do you recognize that signature? I do. And whose signature is that? That is my signature. Okay. So you were aware of this request for the, the wiretap? Absolutely. Okay. And is, having seen these documents now, is there anything you would, would you like to clarify any of your testimony in, or your interview at all? Not at all, no. I, I know that we forwarded the application for the wiretap through the legal counsel process to get their approval before it went back to uh, the Phoenix U.S. Attorney's Office and then on to the OEO in uh, Maine Justice. But, and, and, okay, but you just tes testified just minutes ago that, that you weren't, don't recall ever requesting um, authorization for the, for, for, the, for the T3 intercept. No, I, I said that I never recall receiving this request. I did get the ap actual application for the wire, the many wiretaps, and then they were forwarded it. And this on. is one of those requests? For the wiretap that you that you authorized, the last the, the last slide you put up that had my signature on it for Mark Chait, yes, that would transmit the actual app the actual application for wiretap, yes. Okay. Now, in your interview, were you asked about this? Not this specifically, no. Okay. Did you volunteer it? Not that I recall, no. Okay. Any reason why not? I'm trying to figure out what I need to volunteer. I think I did tell uh, the staff when I was interviewed that I don't recall I, I did recall receiving applications. Because you, did not you downplayed to Mr. Kumar th th your knowledge about any of this. I downplayed to Mr. Kumar my knowledge yes. about. Didn't you? That's no, that's not correct. I I told Dan Kumar everything I knew about this case. And when, when was that? In March of 2005, 2010. It was, it was throughout this investigation. I think Dan sat in on some of the briefings. We discussed it. I see my time has expired. Uh, I would ask the gentleman to have an additional 30 seconds. Would the gentleman yield that 30 seconds? Yes, sir. So if I am to understand, just as a layperson, I am one of the non-lawyers up here, so that is why I introduced the qualified people early on. But as a layperson, it looks to me like you had an intimate part in the wiretap request. Your signature was part of a request process, and yet when we asked you about your being involved in them, you did not volunteer to tell us about this part. You simply relied on you didn't actually sign the affidavit. Is that what you are saying? Is the truth was you didn't sign the affidavit, even though you signed this document and saw other documents and were sent other documents that you may not remember? I signed this document that transmitted the application for the wiretap to our counsel's office for them to review. But you never looked at it? No, I did not. Okay. Again, I think. I said earlier on, mistakes are made, and one of the first questions you asked me, sir, is what mistakes, and that mistake is not doing a thorough enough review of the documents that were coming across my desk. I accept full responsibility for that. I thank the gentleman. Would the gentlelady from New York like to have a round of questions? Well, first of all, the I want to recognized. Thank you, thank you very much, and I, I thank you and the ranking member for, for uh, holding this hearing and all of you for your, your service 
to our country. We appreciate it. We have had a series of hearings. I regret I, I was also in a, a hearing that we are having in financial services that I uh, am ranking member on it, so I had to be there. So I wasn't here for most of it, but uh, Mr. Cummings is going to brief me completely on everything that happened. But um, in one of our prior hearings, we had um, special agents that uh, basically testified uh, that uh, the, the enforcement was not strong enough, that that was one of the problems on the border, that there wasn't an, a, an expressed law against trafficking in guns and uh, that a lot of times the penalties were, to use the terms of one of the agents, he called them toothless, uh, that you really couldn't do anything with it. And, and they said that uh, the penalties, even in trafficking guns and very serious offenses and straw purchases and all kinds of things, really ended up in nothing more than probation. So therefore, they didn't even feel like pursuing um, convictions because they, the, the, the penalty, penalties were so, so lax. And uh, it was inadequate, inadequate either to uh, deter or uh, illegal purchases, and, it, and, in, and it, it wasn't strong enough to encourage the cooperation of suspects when they were um, cooperating. They, they had to have stronger laws. So, so I, I put in a bill with uh, other members of this committee uh, to make trafficking in guns a Federal crime. And I would like to ask Special Agent uh, McMahon and Newell whether or not you think this would help in combating violence, um, drug, drug trafficking, illegal gun trafficking at the border. Currently, obviously, we have a, uh, some laws that are in place that we are using and we are enforcing to the best of our ability. I, I think any extra tool is going to be helpful to us. I think when it gets more specific, uh, as I think some of the legislation that has been uh, uh, presented uh, would be more specific, would make things obviously easier. Do you think it would disrupt the flow of guns on the border? Do you think it would uh, help in that way? I think a tool like that would help, yes. And. Uh and Newell, would you like to also testify on it? Yes, ma'am. I, I believe, in, as a matter of fact, the Congressional Research Service in July of 2009 published a report which said, I believe the title of it was Gun Trafficking in the Southwest Border, and in there they talk about the, the need for a specific statute to address uh, the tra uh, trafficking of firearms by a group of individuals that would aid law enforcement, a statute that would aid law enforcement in being able to address a specific activity that is currently not uh, illegal. So any tool that we would have to assist us in that would obviously be welcome. Does everyone else on the um, panel agree? If you disagree, would you like to express why? Does everyone agree that this would be a tool that would be helpful? Or? I would uh, somewhat disagree. As I stated earlier, I think uh, the, the line in buying the straw purchase is by definition itself, you are buying a weapon or purchasing a weapon or obtaining a weapon for transfer to some other third party in and of itself is trafficking. We, we, we have some personnel that give outstanding trafficking courses throughout my career, certainly the last few years, to, and we provided this training to State and locals as well as to our Federal partners. And uh, lying and buying, straw purchasing is, in, is of itself is, is, is trafficking, and we, well, that is what we promoted during these sessions. Now, I would agree with you that, by definition, a straw purchaser has no criminal history. Therefore, we would have to increase the penalty for those folks that are actually making the initial purchase. That, that's uh, what the bill does. And, and uh, I think oftentimes I listen to the people that are in, in, in the combat, that are on the streets trying to get the job done, which is our special agents. And in several panels, including today, they have said that a strong anti-gun trafficking bill would help them do their job. So I think we should listen to them. Uh, one of the testimonies in our last hearing uh, one of the agents said that they were military-type uh, weapons, that it wasn't uh, uh, no, one re no one wants to inhibit a, a, a hunter f for getting a gun to go hunting with for, or someone to protect themselves, but these were really uh, the type of weapons like AK-47s that are used in military combat, and they were training and trading in these very deadly, deadly guns. Uh, and I understand even the protective equipment um, has to be uh, reinforced for military-type guns. And uh, the, the rule that was put in place to report on uh, rifles that are being, long guns that are being sold, 
uh, was also they testified very helpful, and I'd like to hear what your your uh, your view is from the front lines, Mr. Newell and Mr. McMahon. Uh, we, we were asked that question earlier. I think oh, we really? all agreed mm -hmm. that uh, the demand letter reporting the multiple sale of those white rifles would be helpful for us. Yes. Is there any other tool that this Congress could give you that would help you uh, save lives? Um, we are all for the Second Amendment, for a, a, a lawful person to own a gun, but for a criminal and a drug cartel to have easy access. Uh, I think the number was 40,000 deaths The gentle lady's time year. has expired. Is there a question? Yeah. Yes. Um, I, I just want to know if there are other tools we could give you that would help you combat um, on the front lines the illegal um, uh, sale of guns and uh, that is leading to the, the violence on the border. I, I, I've, been, I've testified before Congress a number of times, and it's not my place to ask. We'll, I know ATF will do whatever we can with the resources and the laws that this Congress provides us. Hmm. Any other okay. With, with that, okay. Uh, we now go to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Meehan. Second, and this is the second round, folks. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, uh, Mr. Newell, I I'm still sort of struggling to find out who knew what when in the form of the not only formulation of this process, uh, but the approvals uh, as well. So it is my understanding that this was conceptualized in November of 2009. Is that correct, Fast and Furious? No, sir. Uh, the, the investigation first began in November of two, uh, 2009 under the name of uh, Jacob Chambers, who at that time was identified as one of the more prolific straw purchasers. Uh, as the case progressed, uh, and, and I will say that in November, about mid-November of 2009, when the special agents started looking into what appeared obviously to be some connected activity in terms of straw purchases, um, she did a phenomenal job in putting a bunch of pieces of the puzzle together, if you will, and, and noticed that one individual by the name of Jacob Chambers seemed to be, at that time, one of the more prolific straw purchasers. That, that, at that time, I think, when she put all the pieces together, what she knew at that time it was something like 350 guns that had been purchased by this group. As the case progressed through December and then early January, uh, we were working out of the OSTEF strike force. I think she realized that it was When did you begin the process of, it, of, of having this be an OSADEF strike force case? Uh, in mid-January, yes. Sir. We in in mid-January of 10? We submitted it as an OSADEF proposal in mid-January of 10, yes. Okay, it was 10. Uh, uh, Mr. Liedman, am I correct from your testimony? We, I, I just heard you make a comment with respect to uh, you, you are an intelligence analyst, among other things. Isn't that correct, that one of the things that you do is try to take a global perspective on how guns may be moving in the United States, in Mexico, in anywhere? Yes, sir. Okay. So part of this is, for, is to follow the flow of guns. Uh, your testimony was that within six weeks of the beginning of this, other law enforcement providers, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, other law enforcement providers provided us with information in December 2009 because you were concerned about guns that were in Mexico, being found in Mexico. So, so in essence, December 2009, prior to really the beginning of Fast and Furious, you as the analysts are already identifying for people that guns are being trafficked into Mexico that you are concerned are coming from Phoenix? Yes, sir. Uh, let me kind of explain that a little bit and bring things in perspective. Um, in November 20th of 2009, uh, there was an interdiction by the Mexican authorities in which there was approximately 41, 42 uh, weapons, firearms recovered. Um, the information we got through the assistance of ICE and so forth down there. Uh, they covered the interviews. W was this in November of 2009, 42 guns were, were, were seized? Yes. And 30 so, so, so 42 guns were seized in Mexico. Correct. And you are just beginning this OSADEF in, in, in January, which means you are moving up the chain and getting approvals from other people beyond you, Special Agent Newell, beyond you, Mr. McMahon. You are getting approvals to pur pursue this. You know 40 guns have already left Phoenix and gone into Mexico at that point in time. Uh, 
Mr. Mr. Newell. Yeah, you are correct, Congressman. Okay. So you, okay, I am correct that in January when you would begin this, you were aware yes. that those guns were trafficked from Phoenix into Mexico. Yes, sir. To be clear on that seizure, I believe Mr. Ledman has better information. I think it was seven of those guns um, were Fast and Furious guns. Thirty-seven. Thir Thirty-seven guns of those guns were Fast and Furious guns. Um, and we did submit in mid-January for OCDEF approval uh, the Fast and Furious uh, uh, Plan. What was the plan then? Because you knew at this point in time, before you testified, that there was no part of any plan that guns would be known to be going to Mexico. Now you are telling me that you are part of bringing an OSADEF because now you have confirmed that guns are going to Mexico and things are going well. So at, at some point in time, I am trying to get clear when it was that you are now participating in, in, in helping to get authority from up higher for a broader investigation. OSADEF, as you said, is multiple agencies that are participating in this. Yes, sir. Like I said, in mid-January of, uh, of 2010, we submitted for OSADEF approval uh, the investigation, which eventually was approved by the uh, Southwest Region OSADEF office in Houston, I believe, the first week of February. You testified before OSADEF right here today, uh, including in this OSADEF uh, from DOJ. The Deputy Attorney General. Yes, sir. Those are your words. At what point in time are you aware that the Deputy Attorney General became aware of any aspect of this investigation? I am not aware at what time he became aware, sir. When do you believe that he became aware? I am not sure. I believe it was uh, earlier this year, but I am not sure. But, but, but you stated that OSADEF from the beginning, these are your words. As this was being conceived, this is your testimony today. It was not just, I asked you where this came from. Right. And then in your subsequent testimony, you identified that this is from DOJ, the Deputy Attorney General. What but I this said, is the conception phase, Mr. Newell, the conception phase. Your words, DAJ, the Deputy Attorney General. So, so, so when did he know it? What did he know? Sir, the what I mentioned about the Deputy Attorney General was that in October of 2009, a draft, and then eventually in January of 2010, a formalized strategy on the uh, DOJ strategy to combat Southwest border uh, violence, drug, Mexican drug cartel Southwest border violence, came out, which highlighted, among other things, how to attack different, different levels of criminality by the Mexican drug cartels, be it firearms, be it drugs, be it you know, bulk cash smuggling. When it came to firearms, there was a strategy outlined there which said, you know, mere interdiction is not is not the only solution. You know, uh, working with co-located OSEF strike forces, it is imperative that we attack the infrastructure and the command and control infrastructure of these organizations to have a lasting impact. Something it, that's not verbatim, but it's something along those lines. The, uh, the gentleman's time has expired. The distinguished former United States Attorney. Um, at this point, the chair would recognize the distinguished gentleman from Maryland, the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Cummings. Special Agent Newell, I want to pick up on the last question. Um, who uh, you testified that Fast and Furious originated with street agents and local supervisor, local su supervisor of Group Seven. You, you remember saying that? Yes, sir. And so, what did you mean by that? I mean, go ahead. Well, because we, we we have a lot of questions as to how this thing came about, and you, that seems to be leading us somewhere. And I just want to see where we're going. Well, yes, sir. A agents in the field, in pursuit of evidence and further of some investigation, some sort of criminality, be it a firearms case, explosives case, an arson case, will open up an investigation with their supervisor's concurrence into whatever they believe to be you know, some sort of criminality by one or more individuals. That is how a case is initiated, and that is how this case was initiated. It was initiated under the name of uh, Jacob Chambers et al. Okay. And Special Agent Camino, you testified that you are a senior trainer and instructor for ATF agents, but have never heard of non-interdiction or gun walking as an approved tactic. Is that uh, it's just not done? No, sir. I've never heard of it. And Mr. McMahon, uh, did anyone at the ATF headquarters instruct Phoenix Group Seven? to conduct the inv investigation in the manner that we know it ended up being conducted in, and to not interdict weapons of known straw purchasers? No, sir, we did not. That is a fact? Yes, sir. So this was not a, a new DOJ policy? Uh, no, sir, it was not a, a new DOJ policy. I think um, 
what we got to realize is guns to Mexico from the U.S. has been a problem for an awful long time. We've been trying to make an impact, and it's something we're continuing to try to do. Mm -hmm. Now, going back to you, Special Agent Newell, you know, if, if we listen to all the testimony, this, this is what it boils down to. You've got, you, you talk, you almost, I mean, I listen to your definition of walking, and you're basically talking about uh, there's a commission, and it sounds like we've got an instance here of omission, in other words, failing to stop guns from going through. So, but there's something bigger than that. And that is, it seems like we need to balance knowing guns are going into Mexico and this grand plan to try to get to the cartel and the whole idea if we omit, um, you know, making sure that these guns don't go in, in other words, we let them go, they go in, let them go in and stand by and watch them where these guns end up and the harm that when they got in the wrong hands, what they would do. That, was there ever a balancing of that? Because that seems like what this boils down to. I mean, I think this, that's why these agents are so upset. They, they, they're trying to figure out, you know, did anybody say, okay, this is going against the policy that we normally do. Um, our, our number one goal is to make sure weapons don't get in to the hands of wrong, the wrong people. But then they're trying to get their arms around, was there some greater, greater cause that was worth it, the risk to see these guns actually land in the hands of the wrong people? Can you comment on that? Do you understand the question? Yes, sir, I understand the question. And one of the things I said in my opening statement, sir, was that I, one of the things I readily admit is that there should have been more, and it was incumbent upon me, that there should have been more throughout the case risk assessments to determine where you were in the investigation. Uh, because, the, 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 as I have said before, the whole plan was to take off the whole organization. But I realize, in retrospect, that there were times when I should have conducted more risk assessments. And to your fellow agents here, you would, I think you would agree, then, that if you did, truly did a, a, a balancing situation, you probably would not have gone along with this, 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 the way it turned, the way things went. Is that right? In other words, the omission piece. Well, are you, are you following me? Yes, sir. You, you got agents. You know what bothers me here? You got agents here who are very, are very emotional about this. I mean, and I, and I appreciate these are honorable people who go out there and put their lives on the line every day, and then they've got you, who's more of a supervisor type. And they are used, I guess, as sort of a military-style operation where you're supposed to do what the folk over top of you tell you. But then you start looking at the folks over top of you, and you say, well, you know, what is this about? So you can go ahead and comment, because we're running out of time. Well, like I said, Congressman, is, uh, in, in my opening statement was, I realize now in retrospect there should have been more risk assessments. I realize that. I acknowledge that. And that was one of the mistakes that were made. I should have had more risk assessments throughout the case. I thank the gentleman from Maryland. Uh, Special Agent Newell, um, there has been some talk this morning and this afternoon about tools in the toolbox, so to speak. What is the penalty for 924C, first offense? Uh, five years, 60, what? Months, 60 months. What is the penalty for the second offense? I believe it is 15 years, sir. What is the penalty for the third offense? I believe it is 30 years, sir. And so you are quickly approaching 60 years yes, with 924Cs. And OSADEF, this was an OSADEF case, right? Yes, sir. What does the D stand for in OSADEF? Drugs. And 924C is a Federal statute that proscribes the use of a firearm during the commission of a drug trafficking offense or other Title 18 offenses, right? Yes, sir. So this had to have a drug connection or it wouldn't have been an OSADEF case. Well, actually, uh, sir, at, I believe in 2008, 2009, the OSADEF office issued guidance which said that you can, in fact, uh, in, you can use the OSTEF program to, to uh, attack firearms trafficking organizations because the, the other related crimes. So These were drug cartels, though, right? The firearms trafficking organization? Right. It was related to a drug cartel, yes, sir. What is the statutory maximum for lying and buying? For the statutory maximum, I believe it was five years, sir. Right. What is the statutory minimum for 924E? Fifteen years. What is the statutory maximum for 924E? It could, be, it could be up to life. Up to life. So you could get up to life 
for 924E, you can get over 60 years, in theory, for 924Cs. And you don't think you have enough tools in the toolbox? I did not say that, sir. Do you believe you have enough tools in the toolbox? I believe the laws that we have now are the ones that we have, and that's the ones we have to use. Any additional tool would be welcome. Let me ask you this. When you begin a sentence, you didn't get this from me. What does that mean to you? It just means that uh, you didn't get it from me. Well, but that's kind of a pleonism, isn't it? Because you are getting it from them. So it, it's, it's a, what do you mean by that? You didn't get this from me. I'm referring to your email to Mr. O'Reilly. Well, obviously, Mr. O'Reilly was a friend of mine, and it's, it's, I shouldn't have been sending him that. Obviously, I recognize that, but it being a friend. But what do you mean you didn't get this from me? Does that mean you should not have been talking to him about it? Not that I shouldn't have been talking about it. He's a friend of mine. He asked for information, and I provided it to him. Well, well then, why wasn't it appropriate for you to give it to him? But why would you preface it by saying you didn't get this from me? Was it an improper communication? No, it wasn't an improper communication. Well, then why would you preface it by that? It's, he's been a friend of mine for a long time, and he asked me for information. So I give him, gave him information that um, just is probably an improper use of the term or phrase. Okay. I would uh, yield my remaining time to the chairman. So following up on where Mr. Gowdy was, and I apologize, we are trying to keep going during the votes, would you, yes, we have one minute left, actually you have 36 seconds left. Uh, the, uh, you, you sent something to somebody because they were a friend that works in the White House on the national security team who requested something about a rather esoteric uh, single investigation. Why do you think they, he asked you for that information that you didn't get these from me? Why do you think he asked for that information that you said he didn't get from you? Well, sir, if, if, if the way I am reading the email now and in rec my recollection, he wasn't asking about a specific investigation. He was asking about our efforts during the gun runner impact team over the summer of uh, twenty. Why do you think he was asking? He was, he, if I recall that email, he was asking for information to brief his boss, I believe, for preparation um, for a trip to Mexico. In, in our efforts along, in our area, along what we were doing to combat firearms trafficking and, and other, other issues. Was the date of this? September 2010. Okay, so this is September 2010. Yes, sir. Wasn't this already a failed program that you had recognized needed to be shut down, that there was a 30, 60, 90 day shutdown some time ago? Wasn't this after you had been frustrated by a U.S. attorney who couldn't seem to end this thing? Well, at, at this time, sir, I believe our case had been over at the U.S. Attorney's Office now for about uh, probably two to three weeks. Okay. Well, let me go to another line of questioning for you, because you know, I have got these ATF agents who don't see the world the way you, Bogota, and your other experience see it, and I just want to understand the difference. You, you saw this as necessary. You saw that you had to make your case. You saw that 30, 60, 90 days went by, even after you recognized that an awful lot of guns had, had walked. You may not have said you walked them, but they walked. They are in Mexico. They are they're, they're distributed broadly. So 2,000 weapons are gone, and you still think this program was a good program, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So you would do this program again? I would. As I said earlier in my opening statements, I would do several things differently if we were to do something like this again. But you would do a program in which you contact federally licensed uh, gun sales organizations, tell them in response to uh, what they believe are suspected straw purchasers to go ahead and install video cameras, watch these people buy, and follow them to a location and then uh, wait to see where they turned up. That would be one of the things in the risk assessments that I would seriously consider changing. What about the American people? 
You said risk assessment. That, you know, that sounds like the doctor telling you that you have non-Hoskins lymphoma and there is a 0 percent chance, but we think we can operate and get you an extra month. Risk assessment. Mrs. Maloney, Ms. Norton, they are radically against the Second Amendment. They absolutely, positively do not want anyone having any guns. They are pretty straightforward about it. They will say they respect the Second Amendment, but they have never seen a gun limitation they don't want. In your case, your agency has a special, special obligation. Maintain the Second Amendment, law-abiding citizens' rights to keep and bear arms, stop bad people from getting them. Now, you said you need more laws. I am going to go to some of the other agents for a moment. Mr. Canino, if the U.S. Attorney agreed to prosecute every case, or in a state where there were strong gun laws, if he or she only gave up that prosecution if the state agreed to prosecute, would we dramatically reduce gun violence on both sides of the border if there was 100 percent prosecution of existing laws? Eliminate gun violence? But no, I said greatly reduce. We're uh, I, I don't. I don't think. Um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't think federalizing. Uh, I don't think federalizing street crime is is the answer. I think there's plenty of gun laws. Now, some of them are better than others. Some of them, there's really no deterrence. There's no no significant time that people are facing, and that's 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 the frustrating part. But um, in my opinion, you know, the political reality is, is that right now there is no appetite or will to, um, to for any substantive legislation. And I am an ATF agent. I, I can't worry about that. I got to worry about uh, catching bad guys. And I am going to do the best I can with what I got. That, and that's, that's it. Agent Wall, uh, you happen to be just south of the San Diego border right now. I am just north of it. Uh, President Bush fired Carol Lamb to a great extent on my request. You know, I don't worry about the other eight U.S. attorneys that got fired. I helped get her fired because she wouldn't prosecute trafficking in human beings and she wouldn't prosecute gun crimes. She basically said, turn them over to the State, and then walked away, knowing that in most cases they wouldn't prosecute. Does it make a difference if you have a U.S. attorney at each of those border areas who takes trafficking in human beings, trafficking in drugs, and trafficking in guns seriously enough to basically not let anyone walk away not being prosecuted just because they might only get six months or a year? Yes, sir, unequivocally. Um, <clears throat> federal agents, police officers on, ta on uh, federal task force, and agents in ATF, in my opinion, we we have a tremendous effect on crime. However, when cases don't get prosecuted, when they language, languish, as I said in my opening statement, and the cases are either declined or uh, uh, given the minimal sentence, it doesn't send a message to the people engaged in this type of activity. Take, for example, gun trafficking. When you have individuals that aren't prosecuted, However, maybe there was a search warrant served and guns were taken from them. All they are going to do is tell the next guy, hey, watch out for these guys that do this because this is how I got caught. But there is no deterrent. We need to prosecute people. We need to put them in prison for this. And we need to put them there for a while. Um, especially Agent Canino, in your experience, if you have got somebody dead to rights, you have got them with the weapons, let us just take our 730 man, if you walked in and said, look, we have got you, we know who you have been selling to, we have got you, if you don't give us a testimony right now, if you don't roll, you are not leaving here and you are going away for a very long time, in your experience, is there a high likelihood that they are going to essentially flip on the next guy up in return for uh, essentially the minimum charge of simply buying and lying? Is that an effective tool when you have what we had in this case? We knew that he had sold to a trafficker. We had hundreds. Any jury is going to consider him part of the trafficking charge you can bring. 
and we had evidence of exactly who he sold to, so we could tell him, we already know who you sold to, but if you are not willing to testify, we are going to put you away with him, and by the way, people have died in Mexico, and then we are going to allow you to be extradited to Mexico. Does that technique, and I am not asking you for your techniques, I am giving you the NCIS one, because that way we are not getting into sources and methods, but does that work? Yes, sir. I mean, depending, you know, each individual is different, um, but if it is done correctly, um, Okay. and uh, respectfully, um, and you treat the person like a human being, and you honestly tell them, hey, you know, these are, these are your choices. Um, so yeah, the carrot is, it. I really don't want to hit you with the stick, but I will? <laughs> Pretty much. I mean, uh, well, let me, let me go to Mr. Ledman for a second. Uh, on March 5, 2010, you did a briefing at ATF headquarters on Operation Fast and Furious. At that time, did you brief that over 1,000 weapons had been sold? Yes, sir, 1,026. Did you, uh, in that presentation, brief and show the links between the straw purchasers and the, uh, oh God, the Sinaloa cartel? I identified the cartel, and in that briefing, I, I showed the links towards the seizures in Mexico and how they uh, moved from Sonora over to uh, Juarez area. So was it clear on March 10th when you gave that briefing that everyone in the room, that guns were going to gun dealers in Arizona and then going into Mexico? Absolutely. Who was in the room at that time? If you Everybody in the senior management, uh, ATF field operations, except for Mr. Melson. Were there representatives of the Department of Justice? Yes, Mr. Who? Joe Cooley. So Justice was fully informed that guns were walking? Well, Even, he, I don't think he's very high-hanging fruit, but uh, uh, he was there. Did anyone express concern at this meeting that the number of weapons appearing in Mexico or the number of weapons bought by straw purchasers seemed to be too high? Yes, um, someone on the other end of the, uh, in the video, because we had a video conference, I believe it was somebody out of the Dallas Field Division, voiced that concern and there was some discussion. So, and we also have a, a memo that says we got to show, slow this down basically at that same time. So at 1,000, it was too many. Let me ask our, our two defenders of this program, and I'm sorry, but that does appear as how your role here today has been. Did it ever occur to either one of you after Mr. Ledman's March 10th, or before, that you could let some of these walk and interdict others, meaning, quite frankly, when, the, when somebody had already bought 100 of them and transported them to him, they weren't, going to trans, they weren't going to sell them to somebody different. You knew he was a straw purchaser. He basically usually had one customer. He's made the sale once, twice, 20 times. Did it ever occur to you to go ahead and at least stop the guns a few times, as you said, uh, Mr. Newell? make it expensive by, by intercepting some of them? Just blind, dumb luck. They had to figure, and this is just me talking, but I, I, I think I have lived this thing long enough. The cartels had to realize at some point that you were helping them buy guns because they were having such a good batting average. Isn't that true? The fact that these guys weren't interdicting the guns almost had to be conspicuous at some point. Couldn't you have at least stopped some of these guns to make it look more real? Well, sir, as I said in my opening statement, that is one of the things I would do different. Um, okay. Well, uh, we are going to take a short recess. There will be a little bit of voting. We will come back. And I know you have been patient. During the recess, our restrooms are available to you. Um, I would suggest that uh, on that side there is a restroom where you don't have to go out and, and be accosted by the cameras and so on. But what I would like you to do, Special Agent Newell and uh, Spe uh, Special Agent McMahon, but for all of you, I would like each of you, if you will agree, to give me back a list of the things that you would do differently. And Special Agent Newell, I would like your list because you are the one that's most said it. Special Agent McMahon, I would like yours because you oversaw it and you have said some things. But for each of the four of you, from your experience, would you each be willing to give me what would be done differently? Now, I know the easy thing is I wouldn't have done the damn stupid thing. But short of that, case by case, break down what would have to be different if this would be done. Because this is the Committee on Oversight and Reform. 
the minority has suggested that we have a pile on a bunch more gun laws and and maybe that will happen someday but i am looking for answers that we can do to get effective work that you need to do effective prosecution and if it needs legislation, we are happy to look at it and, and put it into the mix. But I am looking for the kind of reform, for the most part, that doesn't just assume that a stronger gun uh, law selectively enforced by U.S. attorneys who lose interest in these cases is necessarily the only answer. So uh, with that, we stand in recess until uh, about five minutes after the last uh, vote. <laughs>